4. We read 5, but I want to look at 4 for a moment this morning. Revelation chapter 4. It's the first Sunday of the month, and as such, I have been preaching on the first Sunday of every month on our theme for the year. Our theme is stand, stand firm. And so uh, all of those messages so far this year have been an encouragement for us to take a stand in some way. Uh, Today, a little different with that word, I want to look this morning at us standing in awe of Him. And so I want to look at three different passages in Scripture um, where people were given a glimpse or a vision or uh, some some actual um, uh, physical sight of what happens when God's presence is there. And uh, we see this one in Revelation. We're probably most familiar with this. There's two in the Old Testament we're going to look at briefly. But I want us to just take a moment this morning to stand in awe of him and to reflect on what it means to stand before the holy God. Revelation chapter 4, I'm going to read and then I'll um, have a word of prayer. Revelation chapter 4, after this, this is John. John is given a vision. In the first three chapters, he's looking at the three, at the churches, the seven churches that this uh, book is written to. And in chapter 4, verse 1, he begins to tell us what it is he saw. So this is the very beginning of the vision. Chapter 4, verse 1. After this, I looked. Behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. I will show thee things which must be hereafter, things to come. Immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne was set in heaven, And one sat on the throne. The one is capitalized, right? And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. There was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had had on their heads crowns of gold. Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. There were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. In the midst of the throne, round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. The first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, the third beast had a face as a man, the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. The four beasts had each of them six wings about him. They were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was, is, and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power. For Thou hast created all things, for Thy pleasure they are and were created. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask now Your blessing on the preaching of the Word. Lord, if uh, if ever there was a time, today would be the one where I feel most inadequate, trying in a human uh, human Uh, uh, tense this morning to paint a picture of the throne of the Almighty. Lord, we're very limited on our understanding, I think on our ability to understand. But Lord, these these passages, as well as others, were given to us for our understanding, for our instruction. So Lord, may we be able to look at that which is given to have a better understanding of that throne which is in the heavens. Lord, we thank you that we have this time today. We thank you for your precious word. Lord, allow me this morning the words to say. We ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 
the day is going to come when you and I will stand before the throne of God. The book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 13, which I just read for the Lord's Supper this morning, gives us that very thought. I, if I had continued down through the rest of that chapter, it told us to judge ourselves, otherwise we'll be judged, and that everyone will stand before God someday. And so I thought it would be of utmost importance for us to just have a, a, a moment to reflect upon what that must be like to stand before the throne of God. We're given this passage, we're given some other ones in the Old Testament as well, as when people were given some visions or a little bit of insight on what it was like to stand before God. And so my, my task this morning is to prepare us. Listen, either, either you and I are going to draw our last breath upon this earth, and in death, absent from the body, present with the Lord. And we'll stand before God. That could be at any moment. Or number two, we believe fully that Jesus Christ is going to come back in the clouds to bring rapture up the church, bring up the church, gather up the church. And that as well could be at any moment. And so you and I don't know how soon it may be before we stand before God. And before these things that are to come may be the present tense as we stand before God and these future events become the reality of where we're at. I remember thinking that, uh, and I shared that in a testimony right after my father died. My father died unexpectedly at church, 54 years old, pastor of, of the church that I went to. And I remember saying, but he was, he was instantly in the presence of God, and instantly standing before God. And how important it is that you and I are ready to do just that, that we are prepared. Um, uh, not that, you know, uh, if, if I found out today, I don't have, I, I got a little bit of, uh, of food cooking in a crock pot. There's just enough for my, my little family at home. But if I found out you were coming over today, I'd have to do some preparation, right? One, there's not enough food in the crock pot. Two, I don't know that we ran the vacuum cleaner in the last 72 hours, you know? There, I think post-breakfast, there's a couple dishes in the sink, you know? Uh, there's some things we, you, would, you and I would want to, right? If somebody's coming over, we want to tidy up, get some things ready, prepare things. If, oh, if, if I knew you were coming, I would have... Listen, we don't know. We don't know how soon... You and I will be standing before the Lord. Perhaps like my father, we're gone from this world in an instant and standing before him. Or, or perhaps Gabriel will blow his trumpet Amen. and the church will be raptured up and together in unison, those of us that know the Lord as Savior, will be standing before him. Either way, we look forward to that. Listen to me, I... I don't look forward to dying, but I look forward to being with him. And so we should be prepared for that. And so there's some passages on that. And so Revelation 4 and 5, we looked at that on Sunday nights a number of weeks ago in our Bible study. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. I think it gives us such a, a view. It's, it's as if John the Apostle, of course, he was gathered up in the Spirit. He said that in this very chapter, and the door was opened, and he got a a glimpse of what heaven will be like when you and I stand there. It is what it is like now, but what it will be like for you and I when we stand there someday. And I think it's, it covers so much and it gives us such a, an understanding. I, I hope if anything today, in the context of the message, we are humbled by what we see when we have a glimpse of the throne of God. Chapter number four, John paints that picture. I read it just before I prayed, but John paints that picture of what he was seeing, the throne, the sea of glass. It was as, a, as crystal. He talks about some of the uh, unusual beings that are in heaven. In other words, some of the things in heaven 
are clearly not like things on the earth. And so John was trying to describe them, wasn't he? Well, one was like an eagle, and one was like a calf, and one was like a lion, but they were a little different too because there was something different about those things that he saw in heaven as he was trying to use some earthly terminology or earthly examples to paint the picture of what it was he was seeing. He was trying to paint that for us. He talks about the elders that were sitting there, the beasts that were there. But then the focus upon the throne and the one that sat upon the throne. And he says in verse number three, he that sat upon, was, to look upon was like a jasper and sardine stone. That's an interesting uh, uh, usage there of a unique illustration to point out a, a, a being. This is, we're trying to paint a picture of God Almighty, of the Lord sitting upon the throne. And we're using here some great... Uh, Stones, gemstones, uh, the picture of those things. There was a rainbow round about the throat. I did stop on that for a minute as I was studying this. I, and, and you know where I'm going with this. Listen, that rainbow that's round about the throne is nothing like the abuse the rainbow has taken on, in our country Amen. this last few decades, you know. And I, I've, I've talked about this. I think this is of such significance. The, the, the rainbow, my, my grandkids learned about the rainbow from Sesame Street before they went to school. And, and the rainbow is, the colors are, are Roy G. Biv. You know this, right? Roy G. Biv. Red, orange, yellow. G, green. Blue, indigo, violet. How many colors? Seven. The rainbow that God paints in the sky as a promise, he placed it there first for Noah, right? After the flood, I will not destroy the earth with a flood again. I've made my promise. I've set my bow there. There's a picture of that same bow that was placed in the sky for Noah to see that you and I often catch a glimpse of. It's still kind of unique. When you see one, we usually point it out, right? Like, look, look, there's a rainbow. A real one. <laughs> and when they're in the sky, they're, they're unique right after a rainstorm, usually, in the sun with the water particles, and it paints those seven, those seven colors are painted there in the sky. That, that rainbow is round about the throne. The, the rainbow that's used today by the homosexual movement, listen, isn't it ironic? It only has six colors. I'm not, you can't make this stuff up. Right? It seems like, I, I, it's like, it's as if they don't even care about what the Bible says, but the rainbow they use takes out one of the indigo purple colors and only has six colors. And six is clearly the number of man, clearly the number of sin. God's rainbow has seven. Seven is clearly the number of God, God's perfect order. And if you look at that flag, which is painted there for their movement today, it only has six colors. It's been, listen, it, it irritates me, aggravates me, and angers me that they've taken that symbol that God set as a promise and use it to identify themselves to the point that, like, listen, you and I wouldn't dare put a rainbow flag outside today. People would wonder what we are. Isn't that a shame? But listen, when we stand before the throne of God, what's going to be over the throne? A rainbow, one that God placed there because it's God's promise and God's significance it has nothing to do with how it's been misused and, dare I say, blasphemed here on earth today. It has nothing to do with that. God has a rainbow round about the throne, his, his rainbow. And in sight, like unto an emerald, we've seen the jasper, the sardine stone, the rainbow, the emerald. In verse number five, the throne proceeded. There was lightnings and thunderings and voices and seven lamps. Verse six, a sea like that into crystal. And then the beast that we talked about already at the end of verse six, verse seven, verse eight. Then in verse 10, we have the elders that fall down and give praise forever and ever. 
and ever. What a sight it is that John the Apostle is able to have a vision of, is able to see and write down for you and I when he's standing there looking at the throne. Chapter 5 is what we read earlier in the service. Chapter 5, such a, I, I hope for you, a moving, emotional passage. As the book is given, and it says twice in that passage, no man was able to open that book. No one. There was no one good enough. No person uh, to ascend to the position. No one good enough to open that book. And John the Apostle began to weep because he understood the significance of this. There's no one that can open it until the elder, you can see him lean over, if you would, and say, don't worry. Jesus is here. The lamb, as it were slain, was able to open the book. I see, I mean, do we not see the divinity of Jesus Christ right there? No man was worthy, but Jesus Christ in his glory and in his honor and in, in, in his almighty being of God himself is able to take the book and open the book. No man could do it, but Jesus did it. Exodus chapter 19. I told you we'd look at two other passages. I think we'll see some similarities. We looked at this briefly a couple weeks ago when we were in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews 12 actually refers to this passage. Exodus 19, I'm going to read through some of this. I'm going to read Scripture today. Exodus 19, verse 1. In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt. So they're three months out of Egypt. The same day came thee to the wilderness of Sinai, where they were departed from Rephidim. Come to the desert of Sinai, had pitched in the wilderness. There Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thou sh thus Shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then shall ye be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel." Moses came and called for the elders of the people, and he laid before their faces all these words which the Lord commanded them. And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Moses, Lo, I come unto thee in a thick cloud, that the people may hear when I speak with thee and believe thee forever. And Moses told the words of the people unto the Lord. The Lord said unto Moses, Go unto the people, sanctify them today and tomorrow. Let them wash their clothes. Be ready against the third day, for the third day the Lord will come down in the sight of all the people upon the Mount Sinai. Thou shalt set bounds upon the people round about, saying, Take heed to yourselves that ye go not up into the mount, or touch the border of it. Whosoever toucheth the mount shall surely be put to death. There shall not a hand touch it. But he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether it be a beast or man. It shall not live. When the trumpet soundeth long, thou shalt come up into the mountain. Moses went down from the mountain to the people. He sanctified the people. They washed their clothes. He said unto them, Be ready against the third day, and come not at your wives. It came to pass on the third day in the morning, there were, listen, thunders and lightnings. Does that sound familiar? Thick cloud upon the mount. The voice of a trumpet. We saw that in Revelation 4 exceedingly loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the nether part of the mount. Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke, because the Lord descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him, by a voice. I'm going to stop right there. We get the context of, the, of what they saw. Listen, this was the Apostle John was caught up in a vision to see things that were to come, to see future events. He said he was in the Spirit 
a door was opened to heaven, and he was able to see the throne of God. Exodus chapter 19, not heaven. This is God coming to talk to people on earth. This is God coming to give the, the, the law of Exodus chapter 20. The next chapter, just verses from now, we have the Ten Commandments as we know them. And so God's beginning to give the law to Moses and to the people. And he's telling them what his covenant is with them, what his expectations are. And he allows them to see much of what John got to see in heaven, when he saw into heaven, right? The, the thundering, the lightning, the smoke, the voice of a trumpet. Isn't it interesting? Um, I, I, I said in some type of, of light manner at the beginning, if you were coming to my house, there's things I'd have to get ready. God said to him, I'm coming on the third day. Go wash your clothes, he said. Right. Go get yourselves ready. I, I, isn't, that, isn't that a put on your best? Get prepared. Uh, prepare. Don't come near the mountain. Don't touch the border of the mountain. This is holy ground, right? Stay back, and I will tell you what my expectations are for you, God said. Isn't it interesting to see what God's expectations are when God speaks? I, in the midst, and this is um, number three on my notes here. Uh, if you're writing down an outline, good luck today. I'm just telling you. I wrote down, we need to stand in awe of our own insignificance. You know. In our Sunday school lesson, it was a review lesson for the Answers in Genesis curriculum. Guest speaker was on the video included in the curriculum today. And he talked about that. Remember, he gave a little illustration there about the lady at the nursing home who was offended by singing Amazing Grace for such a wretch as I, a wretch. She's like, I'm not wretched. Look at all those other people, you know. They're... We stand before the holy God. I think we are encompassed by nothing but my unworthiness, by my sin, by my inability. Listen, when John the Apostle saw a glimpse of that and no one was worthy to open the book, John wept. Why? Because he understood. We're standing before an almighty God and in our sin and in our problem and our insignificance, we can't touch that. We can't go to that. We can't come there. Listen, this is important. Bear with me. God told the Israelites, don't come up the mountain, don't come to the mountain, don't touch the border of the mountain. Stay back. I think you know where I'm going. This kind of goes along with next week's, last week's message, if you will. Hebrews chapter 4, we preached a number of weeks ago. Because of the finished work of Jesus Christ... Because of what he did, because of what we just recognized with our Lord's Supper communion service this morning, God now says you may come boldly before the throne. Boldly come. Make your request. Come, come to me in prayer. Ask. Ye have not because you ask not. Come. Come boldly. Why? How, how are we able to do that? Because of what Jesus did on the cross. Because we're not coming in our sin. We're coming in, in his righteousness. And so, standing before the throne of God, we should, one, be overcome with our insignificance and simultaneously be overwhelmed with what Jesus did for me and allowing me access to the throne of the Almighty. Isaiah, I want to look at the other one, Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah chapter 6, I think these are three good pictures we have, not the only ones, but some of the more well-known ones, Isaiah chapter 6, I think we'll again see some, some similarities here, here's Isaiah, this is Isaiah, the calling on Isaiah's life. 6 verse 1, Isaiah 6 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, 
and his train filled the temple. And Isaiah now is going to try to picture some of those beasts around the throne, all right? Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, with two he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Mine eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts. Isaiah understood his unworthiness. He understood the situation he was in. I've been given a vision to see the, see, see the throne, to see the Lord. Who am I? I? I'm a sinner. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand. Again, in this vision here, which he had taken with tongs from off the altar, he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, Thine iniquity is taken away, thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Notice the result. Notice the reaction Isaiah had. So he's standing there looking at the throne. He's like, what, what am I doing here? I'm a man of unclean lips. I shouldn't be viewing this. I shouldn't be seeing this in the... In the vision, the seraphim came and he took the coal and anointed him and says, no, no, your sin has been paid for. It's been purged. By faith, Isaiah was looking forward to the Messiah coming, the one that we get to look back at. Your sin is paid for. So then the one on the throne said, I need someone to go. And Isaiah, it seems like, couldn't answer fast enough. Here am I. Send me. Standing before the throne of God changes our priorities. It changes our perspective. It changes where we're at. It changes what I want. I think standing before the throne, Isaiah had nothing left to say, but I'll do whatever, Lord. Send me. Did he know the extent of what God was going to ask him to do? No, it didn't matter. He was going. John, John moved with emotion. As he saw into the throne, into heaven, and saw the throne and what God was doing, moved to the point he was crying because no one was worthy until the Lamb stepped forward to open the book. And those Israelites out in the wilderness, when God was coming to give the law and they, they saw the smoke and the thunderings and the trumpet and the noise, and when God said, this is what I want you to do, their reaction was, we will do it. We know the end of that story. Over time, they forsook that. Over time, they walked away from that. I would hope that in the midst of this, we have two perspectives. One, what's heaven like? What's it going to be when I stand before God? Am I ready to stand before God? But then number two, I hope we can take the invitation of Hebrews chapter 4 to boldly come before the throne. In other words, that we stand in all of the Almighty God right now. We have such a crass, careless, flippant attitude about God in our society, in our culture today, right? Obviously, there's a great part of our culture that has nothing to do with God, don't believe God, don't care about God, don't think about God. But even those that do, that maybe even consider themselves Christian, have a flippant attitude where God's my buddy, you know. God's just my friend. You know, I just hang out with God. We have that flippant type of attitude with that. Listen, when we st stand before the throne, when we see what Isaiah saw, when we see what John saw, I think if when we see what the Israelites saw in the wilderness and the trumpet and the thunders and the lightnings and the vision of the Almighty God, we're not going to have any recourse of standing there thinking we are anything. 
What an opportunity we have, though, when that almighty God says to you and I, come before the throne. Come. Boldly come. Why? Because you're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. So you have access now. Boldly come. You have not because you ask not. What a privilege that is to walk with him. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we've had today. Lord, just, just wanted to give an overview there as we stand in awe of the throne of God. Lord, I don't think in any way, in any way we could eloquently paint the picture. It seems like Isaiah and John as well were struggling to come up with the right words and the picture of what they saw. It was overwhelming to them. And so, Lord, I pray that we, one, put into perspective the fact that every knee will bow. We will stand before the throne someday. Are we ready to do that? And then number two, we have access to the throne right now. You've called us as your children to come to stand, to come to give requests, to come and have access. Lord, that one angel, John chapter number four and five the one angel had the vial full of the odors, which were the prayers of the saints. You told us to boldly come before the throne to find help in time of need. And Lord, you've, you've kept those prayers. You've kept those things. Lord, we thank you that we have access. We thank you for who you are. We thank you we have access before the throne. Lord, may we walk worthy of that. Lord, we give you the honor, the glory, and the praise. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen. Our last song is, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. It's 826. Let's stand together as we close.